Let's see, Ma is a doctor in our history from UCLA and sorry, sorry. From, <laughs> from US UC San Diego. From San Diego <laughs> University. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm sure it's better than UCLA. <laughs> Specific department with a specific um, agenda, you could say. But uh, her interests are uh, larger and go far beyond the medium in itself at the department that she is a or at the specific uh, position that she's in at the museum. She's yeah, herself expanding the notion of ink. She won't talk about that today. She will talk specifically it's about um, what she will introduce right now. So <laughs> I won't <laughs> say anymore. So please welcome Leslie Ma. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you um, BAP, for inviting me here today. Um, as Cindy said, I'm the Incar curator at M Plus, the new museum that will open next year in Hong Kong. Um, I very much cherish this opportunity to talk about something other than ink, <laughs> um, but it's actually quite related to my own um, research on um, post-war Taiwanese art and the art in the region. Um, so, but you'll see some traces of ink here. I have to work that in, and we all know that visual histories are um, in different sectors are related to each other. So there will still be some slices of that. Um, so um, I'll start. Um, so we're looking at the avant-garde um, in Taiwan in the post-war time. Um, so I'll go over a few key artists, um, especially image makers, um, uh, filmmakers, photographers, um, theater producers, as well as publications. Um, these areas where might not be considered fine art at the time and not really in academies. Um, but how artists were uh, uh, forging new ground um, in these areas in this post-war time. Um, so before I go there, um, a brief history of what happened in Taiwan. Um, as many of you know, um, Taiwan was under Japanese colonization for 50 years, um, from 1895 to 1945. So that's quite a long time. Um, so after World War II, um, as you can imagine, the period starts as a re, um, recovery from that colonial period, um, re uh, synthesized or becoming more Chinese because um, Taiwan was receded back to the um, Republic of China. So the idea of taking away that Japanese culture that's been there for 50 years. Um, and coming back to a Chinese culture, that's the huge mandate that the Bolivian uh, government was instigating. Um, so um, in, in 1947, um, 228 incident where uh, locals and um, uh, mainlanders who moved in um, had huge conflict. I guess the rulers and the ruled um, had a lot of um, uh, conflicts. I just, summarize that in that way, uh, which is still uh, being sorted out today. In 1949, uh, the nationalists uh, were defeated by the Communist Party and retreated to Taiwan and began the time in Taiwan as uh, the Republic of China. So I'm not going to go through everything, but I'm just kind of give you some milestones of histories there. And within this period that we're talking about, there are two major wars. Well, I guess I have to say three, because World War II was the major one that really wrote every, everything together. And as Inti had said, um, the Pacific War really um, um, is a war that went through, um, and everyone in this region had experience, um, and we'll talk about that later. And then the Korean War and the Vietnam War were two other major wars in this area, where um, uh, sort of post-colonial and uh, recovery, and as well as um, the new Americanism has been um, strongly in presence here. Um, so um, in the last bit of the uh, chronology here, I sort of 
um, outlines a few things between sort of uh, the relations between Taiwan or the Republic of China and elsewhere. So you see the way that the country has uh, first became, I guess, the bastion of what Chinese culture is as national discovery moved to Taiwan, taking out the Japan uh, influences. Um, how do you make this place the, the representation of Chinese culture? But then as the international winds have changed, um, that status in international diplomatic sense have been taken away. Um, it challenges how this country and its people try to see itself uh, where its culture is. And so uh, if between 1949 and 1987, quite a long time, is martial law period. Um, as you understand what martial law is, um, lots of uh, um, censorship, um, limited freedom in artistic expressions, especially in literature, um, art making, um, and so on. But I think in those times uh, when you have these kind of uh, 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 tight scrutiny on what you can make, artists find ways to um, perhaps be a little bit more um, uh, subtle about what they want to say, and uh, I'll show that to you in a bit. <coughs> So, as we learn about the visual art world of Taiwan, um, these are three artists in the colonial period. Um, you can see their dates. Um, the first one, Chen Jing, is a woman. Um, the other two are men. Um, they also, in, in the colonial times, as uh, if you want to be a successful artist, you go to Japan. If you're from Taiwan, you want to be success successful. You go to Japan and you learn the Japanese way of painting. So these artists, um, they actually all use ink brush, but in the Japanese training of uh, Nihonga. So these are, um, they use gouache and the colors are a bit more, uh, the, the pigments are more vibrant than the Chinese ink paintings. But in, even though they paint it in the Japanese trained way, uh, the topics, the subjects they paint are decidedly Taiwanese um, or Chinese. Um, so you see the, the, the cows, um, the representation of um, the, the sort of rice patties and, and the Taiwanese uh, localism. Uh, the top is a Chinese lady um, in her uh, bedroom. So it's, it, it almost reminds me of um, the lady Olympia, but in a different way, in a different place. Um, but beautiful lady paintings is a traditional genre in Chinese painting as well as Japan. So, but here you can see the, the, the lady's dress is very much Chinese. So these are ways that artists inserted their Taiwanese consciousness during the colonial times. And now we jump to post-war. Um, on the left are two artists also trained in Japan. Um, and they you can see the top artist, Li Shichao, painted the street scenes in Taiwan. Um, so you see a sort of Western dress lady um, with sunglasses in this kind of modernized city. And on the bottom, um, a bit of focus, um, Western influence painter, painter, both of them trained in Japan, so the way that they brought back to Taiwan is what they learned there. But on the right are two um, perhaps establishment artists um, coming from mainland China with the nationalist government. Um, very much so, um, Hu Xingyu, the one on the left, um, he it was a relative of the emperor of Qing dynasty, so um, very much the, um, the pedigree of the traditional um, palace-trained um, painter. Um, on the right, Huang Junbi is uh, from the Lingnan uh, movement, so in the Guangdong area near Hong Kong. Um, after he went to Taiwan, he was the private tutor of Zhang Kai, this is Zhang Kai Shen. So you can see what I meant by establishment artists. But what they're painting is you know, very much the continuation of what ink landscape painting would look like uh, from that uh, 1930s, 40s style. But when they moved to Taiwan, this is something that they wanted to carry on. Um, something that, um, even though the mainland is no longer the territory, that, remind, that is, remains in your artistic expression. And that's what, um, in a way, nationalist government at that, at that time wanted this to be the official voice. They did co coexist with the um, Japanese trained artists in, in this way. Um, you can see there's tension of you know, who's more modern, um, and that's always a debate between these two sides. But these two 
sort of these two types of paintings are both taught in the academies in the post-war time. Very academic. But I must show what happened, what's happening in mainland China at this time. As you know, um, socialist realism is dominating um, in that kind of environment. Um, propaganda paintings mostly. But these are ink painters trying to survive under the propaganda uh, regime. Um, painting socialist realist themes using ink painting. Um, you can probably see, you can see similar things in, in, in Korea. Um, around this time, but um, I mean, artists still try to insert a bit of their um, agency here. You see that the right, on the right see is the, the happy scene of a collective work, um, uh, workers uh, um, canteen, but um, in, the, in the background you see landscape painting. So they still kind of insert a bit of um, what they learned in schools there. Star contrast. Um, so we're gonna jump to, um, I want to show a bit of the um, multicultural influences in Taiwan in this post-war decade, because I mentioned the Japanese influence, I mentioned the Chinese influence, but because Taiwan is on this so-called Great Crescent, which is the American strategic um, line on the map from Japan, Korea, to Taiwan, down to the Philippines, this line of Great Crescent against communism, um, the kind of American materials, as well as European, via that that that, um, that channel comes into Taiwan, and you and also in Taiwan after uh, 1949, everyone from mainland, from north to south to east to west, all landed here. So it's a it's a melting pot of sorts. So in this uh, documentary, um, it's not meant to show that, but I'm using this to as a way to show what it sounds like at the time. artists I'll talk about later, uh, Chin Yao Xi, a documentary, uh, documentary artist. And you see him following the ordinary lives of people. And I like to pay attention to the soundtrack that's going to come in in two or three or four seconds. So uh, this is this is Guangzhou, uh, Cantonese cuisine that says Nanjing, that says Big Shanghai clothing store. Um, another restaurant called Beijing, Qingdao restaurant. So it's like every city here in mainland China, and then we end with a Hollywood poster. So it's the concoction of this um, you know, multicultural, um, I guess, visual culture that's available at the time um, in 1960s. At the same time, um, in entertainment, I guess, film culture, um, Taiwan is very much connected to what Hong Kong um, film industry has been making since the uh, 60s as a start. With Shaw Studio, you might know Bruce Lee's movies comes in in the 70s, but starting in the 60s, uh, film industry started in Hong Kong, um, as well as Taiwan. But on the left, you see an example of a Taiwanese production Beautiful Duckling. Um, it's called Healthy Realism because the, uh, it's funded by the uh, government, a government funded uh, movie studio, per, um, producing films of subject matters of people working very hard but eventually prevailing and um, get, feeling reward, a rewarding experience as hardworking. So, painting a beautiful picture of a hard life. <laughs> so, <laughs> healthy realism, uh, supposed to boost morale and make you feel better, and everyone should work, work hard, work together to make our country better. Not too far from socialist realism, but it's healthier. Um, on the right, you see um, the Butterfly Lovers, which is a uh, classical love story, kind of like the Romeo and Juliet um, in, in Chinese culture. Um, it's called Huang Mei Opera. It's a kind of a traditional opera musical singing um, in, in movie form, so very much related to theater. And so this is a um, classic, classic film produced um, in 1963. Um, and since we have performance tomorrow, um, the two leads are actually both women. Um, but the, uh, 
that she, both of them are still alive. I mean, if you ask my mom's generation, they see these two people somewhere all screaming. Um, but so these are films not about romance, about you know how um, little joys of life sort of should take away your sorrows and you know forget about what's happening um, in real life. So this is really mainstream, very much um, occupying people's visuals, uh, visual senses. Um, but we also have um, image makers, photographers who are documenting what's happening in, in Taiwan at the time. So these are three um, representative, representative uh, photographers working during this time, all born in Taiwan, um, as opposed to born in China. So you, you see examples of a country um, theater fair, outside of, usually, usually outside of temples. On the top right, you see um, a portrayal of uh, aboriginal communities. On the bottom left is a, a street scene, but you see a Japanese tori, tori on the right side, um, the Shishito uh, structure, and then you see workers. So there are people really paying attention to what's actually happening around us. And so I want to add a bit more about where this, uh, the, the backdrop of all of this is the nationalist government's strong um, uh, strong um, education on the importance of Chinese culture. What you're looking at are two, probably the uh, most treasured paintings in the National Palace Museum Taiwan collection. Um, so the Palace Museum collection came from the Imperial Palace in Beijing as well as the Nanjing um, uh, Museum. And the national government, nationalist government moved these treasures from mainland China to Taiwan starting in 1948 because of the war, and now still stored in, um, in Taipei. Um, but the museum wasn't finished until 1965, so then before then, um, artists couldn't really see these paintings in person. So around this kind of time in the 60s, they were starting to exhibit these works. These works actually went to the Metropolitan Museum between 1961 and 62. Um, as a way of diplomatic um, relations between America and, and the ROC, showing that you know Taiwan is the, the where a Chinese culture is, but these works also were shown to the locals who previously had no access to the imperial collection. So these are the ink paintings that defined um, the uh, the scholar <coughs> scholar painter's style, which also resonated with the um, art makers at the time. So, because of these, uh, because of these more traditional works, um, has this aspirational um, uh, 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 simulation for the viewers. This kind of grandiose landscape of that great territory and great history, Greek culture that we have. Um, a generation of artists who went to the uh, art school called National Normal University Fine Arts Department, which is still working today. Um, the most, um, I guess, orthodox, the most prestigious um, school. Um, they look at these um, literati paintings, these landscape paintings from the Song Dynasty, as a, a spiritual lighthouse. But they don't want to produce something that looks like that anymore. They want something to aspire to that, but produce something that's more related to their own experiences. So two groups of uh, modernist artists, um, Dongfang and Wu Yue, Fifth Moon artists, the two Fifth Moon group and Dongfang group, um, first worked in abstraction, um, and then they looked to how to marry, marry abstraction from a Western influence to um, uh, the Chinese ink painting. They realized that when Western art movements of abstract expressionism talks about abstraction with no representation, they realized that Chinese are always had that. It was never really about a mountain, what the mountain really looks like. When you're painting a mountain, it's really about your own sort of more morality, um, how you see the world, your, your inner landscape. So then they thought, well, we can also use that. Um, I'll show a bit more later, but these are, on the top row are the Fist Moon group artists. All of them graduated from the, um, the, the school that I spoke about. Um, you can see the, the traces of abstraction, but also um, ways that they want to make ink, ink aesthetic something that speaks for the culture rather than the actual mountain uh, imagery. 
And on the bottom is another group called Dongfang. Uh, Dongfang means Eastern, so they're trying to look for ideas in more ancient Chinese culture um, and marry that with um, abstract abstraction. So you see the use of calligraphic brushwork and strokes as a way to uh, make these new marks and symbols. So this is um, the Fifth Moon Society um, group, and they came, so they started working together around 1957, making annual exhibitions. At first, you can see their, 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 the visuality of their work is very much different from the um, uh, John, Mrs. John Kaishek's teacher or the emperor's relative. So that was a huge sort of scandalous kind of new style. But around the early 60s to mid 60s, they started to gain prominence because their work attracted um, some American um, American art historian of Chinese art mm -hmm. and validated them as the, sort of the, the, the next generation of Chinese artists. So that's sort of how they gained more prominence within their own country. And these are some exhibition scenes um, at the time. I think actually exhibitions during that time in anywhere in Asia kind of all looked like this. So they had a, you know, had a hall that's not really designed for art exhibition per se, but you know, and then you kind of just hate works like that. Actually, this group of artists, a few of them had works shown in Manila um, at the Blues Gallery in the 70s. So there was some um, uh, uh, exchange in that. So, I was saying that American influence, um, there, there are these things called USIS Library, which is a branch um, of the U.S. State Department, um, stationed in almost every city in, um, in, on the Pacific Rim, places where cult American culture is um, available in these places in the forms of magazines, books, uh, films. So these are places where um, martial law cannot touch, Artists can go there and look at any art books and you know, trend the magazines at the time. So this is a shot of, it's actually before, in the, in the Taipei location, it used to be um, a, a Japanese colonial office for education as well. So interestingly, it was taken over by um, Americans. Um, and many artists um, of that generation in Taiwan have spoken of it later as the place where they can find inspirations, things that they couldn't, they didn't teach at schools, they weren't available, but also the newest uh, Life magazine, Time magazine were all there, so they see what's happening outside. This is an example of a local, pro locally produced um, uh, literature and arts magazine um, using images where, from other uh, imported American magazines to show what abstract art looked like. So you go from uh, Marcel Duchamp's uh, New Descending the Staircase on the bottom right, the left one, Picasso, um, to Franz Klein, to a, a, to a image here I circled in purple, uh, Jackson Pollock dripping. So, I mean, and, and, and Egyptian paintings abstraction. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's examples of abstraction, so it doesn't actually matter where it came from, but it's, it's showing, you know, whoever wants to read this. These are examples of abstract art, and um, it's hodgepodge, and you can take whatever is useful to you. Um, another example from the same magazine, um, you see that this is, the title is uh, American 20th Century Art Overview. Um, so you see Hopper, you see um, Toby, you see um, uh, Morris Graves, and, and Franz Klein again. Um, so you know, from these little pictures, artists get the idea of what they need to do to be international. So this is a segue to um, the very vibrant print culture, um, print media. So in a time where, when um, arts institutions, um, exhibition venues are few and far between, and most of them are either related to schools or uh, official uh, competitions, the magazines actually become the primary site for artistic production and debates. So these are several examples um, of, of magazines that were 
uh, circulating then, um, usually produced by either people with journalistic backgrounds or um, artists who um, put money together, even when there were students, put, put money together to uh, produce content. On the left, you see um, one of the covers is Miro's painting. You see Picasso on the top right. Um, and on the bottom right um, is uh, the preeminent Chinese-French artist, Zhao Qi. So um, I don't know if people know about Zhao Qi's work. Uh, perhaps the most high price traded artist in today's uh, art market. Um, he passed away in 2013, originally from, uh, from mainland China. And he went to France um, in 1948 and became immersed in that um, artistic scene of lyrical abstraction. Um, his painting has a similarity with Fernando Zobet. So lyrical abstraction with this kind of, uh, um, you know, a, a, brush, a brush work that came from Chinese painting, but using oil. Um, so this idea of, sort of landscape um, landscape-y um, abstraction. But because he was so successful in um, immersing into the French art circle, but also marrying Chinese ink painting aesthetics with oil painting. So a lot of artists of that 1950, 60 generation was so enamored with his success and how he was able to bring his two cultures together and be successful in the Western world. Um, he, he got all the awards of any French painter could ever want it. Um, um, so may remain that status, you can see why he's on the cover. Um, and actually the cover, the magazine is called This Generation, so they really admire his work. Um, and so that brings me to uh, the print media culture um, that spawn off from that modernist um, aspiration. Um, and um, the, this is actually the meat of our, my talk today, the Theatre Quarterly, which became in 1965, um, only made nine issues in three years, um, started by a group of young people who are not so much into the painting, abstract paintings that I talked about. Of course, they, um, they don't feel like that represents what um, his, their generation should be saying. Um, because that visuality of ink is still something old, something from the mainland, something that's a previous generation, and it just seems archaic. So they're looking to other venues and other ways to, um, to find their own voice. So theater, theater magazine was born um, in, in that kind of context. Um, it was produced as a quarterly magazine, um, but sort of stopped production because the members had to either go to military service and then have to go to jail, but um, <laughs> various obstacles. But what's interesting about this magazine is that um, the title is Ju Chang, which is theater, but inside the content is actually heavily translated um, uh, um, screenplays, um, screenplays, um, uh, theater plays. Basically, as you can imagine, in the time of martial law, there isn't, there wasn't so much foreign material available. So things are very much selected. So if you get your hands on, let's say, um, Inesco's play or even Beckett, um, what the, these artists do is they translate it for everyone. So these are the, perhaps the first Chinese translation of Waiting for Godot, um, for all these um, iconic Western plays or screenplays. Um, there was a whole, whole translation of last year in Marion Bad. So, you know, so these are artists and when they couldn't really have access to films or see theater plays, text is the way that they experience what these kind of avant-garde artists elsewhere have been doing. So, um, and they also um, have other, because of the theater group of artists, um, they also produce other kind of um, activities outside. So I'll show the key people um, that were in this group. Um, so the three people I'll talk about is Huang Ha Chen on the top left, Zhang Ming on the middle to the top, and Zhang Zhao Tang on, on the bottom um, middle. And he was actually born in 1943, so I was a typo there. But yeah. these are the core, uh, uh, core group of artists who um, either 
none of them are actually trained in fine art except for Hong Hachin. Um, everybody is so-called amateur because they wanted to explore um, wanted to explore image making as something different from what they know. Um, in fact, um, Zhang Ling and Zhang Jiaofang in the middle, the two of them, um, in the nineteen in mid nineteen sixty, they actually went to work for the state state owned television stations. So um, there's three stations at the time. So each one of them worked at one, the one each. Um, and that's where they actually get the most um, information because as a journalist um, in the journalistic office, you not only get information um, out from outside, of course it's limited, but more than most people would, they also have access to the best machines at the time. So they can borrow them uh, to film other things they want to do. And, um, and on the right, the two, um, two per people on the right are mostly writers, so really masterminds behind some of these translations um, and concepts um, of, that, of that magazine. So, as I said, um, theater, the, the group of people who produce theater um, put up plays, they translated Waiting for Godot, and they made it happen um, as part of the auxiliary um, uh, extra programs for the magazine. Um, as you know, the play is about four hours long, um, and they did it with, um, I actually think that the translation wasn't great, but I mean, that was better than nothing. And they just played whatever they think should be the staging and blocking. Um, it was well attended at the time, apparently, and it didn't get shut down because it was so, uh, um, I guess, esoteric. Um, <laughs> that, that the censors didn't really get what they were doing. What, about, what do you mean waiting for something or something like that? <laughs> so, um, it was so absurdist and so out of that context of what people would know. Um, but you can see, I mean, the, the play is ex existentialist, right? So it's actually a way for these young artists to um, channel their idea, this, their ennui, their frustration, their angst that in their society weren't really allowed to say more than that. So um, it's quite an interesting way of channeling um, your own sort of sense of rebellion through almost a classic play in the, in the Western society. Um, Prophet is a play by Hong Hachin, also in an absurdist way. Um, this was served as an a, 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 um, appetizer before the waiting for Godot. And this is where um, they use the, the female actress is a, a, a actual TV actress. And on the left, John Lane is one of the theater members who um, got for shop stage to perform. So this is a play, um, uh, happened both on stage and in the theater, uh, and the uh, audience sees so breaking that fourth wall um, in an absurdist way. So, as I've spoken about Drumling, who was the actor in that previous play, um, he worked at one of the television stations. Um, he's an interesting character in this time um, uh, because his um, his father um, his father was the chaperone for all the palace museum treasures coming from mainland China to Taiwan. So his whole family, his whole life before he got to, well, his whole life up to this point has always been living with the treasures. Um, and so then you can see how much of that burden of 5,000 years of Chinese culture <laughs> residing <laughs> um, in his family. And he's seen all these paintings, you know, he knows all this, he knew all these um, traditions. But he also decided that this is not really for me, that's for my parents' generation. They had a purpose, they, they dealt with these uh, materials, but for his own generation, he really wanted to look at what um, cameras can do. So as I said, he worked at one of the TV stations, so he was able to borrow the, the camera, uh, use 8 millimeter film, and film his whole family. There's no money to do anything else or as a production. So he made two films in these two years, um, Life Continued and My Newborn Baby, now my one-year-old. Um, <laughs> so basically, the first film, Life Continued, is following his pregnant wife, who had to go to work from one part of town to the other part of town, take three buses and walk, and she worked, she's a scientist. Um, so you see how it's a very, very ordinary life, but as I showed before, what people normally see at the time is you know, romance and and this kind of healthy realism of like happy, happy, happy things, right? But her, the film has really no ups and downs. So you actually just see her um, going to work, wearing a lab coat. Um, and what's interesting is parts of that home life, because it's very traditional family, 
they still live with the parents. So you see the, the, the deputy director of National Palace Museum do <coughs> Tai Chi at home, and then the next scene was <laughs> the daughter-in-law going to work in a science lab in a different part of town. So really, I think that transition between, you know, um, and also this is when the family lived near the Palace Museum, so you see that as a backdrop. So you really see that focus, a literally focus of that generation moved from what National Palace Museum represent to people who are living there daily. Um, you know, so very much transferring that to a Taiwanese, looking at a Taiwanese life. And then the next film, My Newborn Baby, is the baby is born, <laughs> so that one here. Um, and you know how just general family life and very, you know, I wouldn't say it's very dramatic, but you actually see that sweetness of, um, you know, just very, very intimate family and having um, an okay life in this place. So it's, it doesn't probably, it probably doesn't seem like a radical move at the time, but retrospectively, it is something so mundane, but so um, different from what was available at the time. Um, the theater group also had these film screenings where um, the previous two films I talked about were shown, but there's also more radical works. And this work is um, Lost, um, it's called Experiment uh, 002 by Hong Ma Cheng, where he filmed a friend of his um, naked, running on the outskirts of Taipei, um, and using one shot. So, you know, these artists really didn't know too much about film techniques, and they're trying different things that they have. Um, learned, um, but nudity obviously is not going to be okay in, uh, in the martial law time. So uh, when they showed this film, it was quite sensational. But in experimental film circle, there's not that many people that came. <laughs> but um, you know, by showing that, it's also it, it was a very um, a radical gesture. Another artist, Zhang Zhaohang, um, also used one of his friends as actor, um, putting on these white makeup, almost like masks. The whole story really is him looking at the mirror, looking around to look for himself. Very literal, um, but you know he, he couldn't he see, see himself in the mirror, couldn't recognize himself because you know what is I don't need to explain more. So the, the imagery is very. Um, uh, uh, very, very stunning at the time, and I'll show his photography work later. Zhang Dahan went on to be not only a very successful documentarian, he also uh, was a cinematographer for many Hong Kong, iconic Hong Kong films um, in the 80s. So what's really fun about this group of artists is that because they try to push boundaries, they didn't really want to do what everyone else had been doing, so they really, they're the rebe re rebels of, um, of the art world in Taiwan. But actually, they're all friends, even you know, the, the ink painters that I showed, not the old ones, but the, um, the ones that did abstraction. They're actually all friends together, they, they attend each other's openings. So this Echo the Great Taipei exhibition is actually just one person's show. It only happened once. There was not really an echo, but um, it, was, it was a kind of a funny way of calling your own um, uh, solo show. This is by Paul Ha Chen, um, the, the artist that made the, um, the the artist that made this film. So um, here on the very left, so this is a gallery space on the third floor of a building. Um, at the very um, entrance, you have to step on this collage of Western um, iconic paintings in reproduction. So it has a doormat, you have to come in, you have to step on all those iconic things that you have learned at school, and then you see this little boy is really contemplating what to do. Um, and he was running around this space that's actually the, probably the first installation art in, uh, in Taiwanese art circle during that time. Um, so it's basically order, very ordinary um, objects in the house, in, in, the, in the gallery. Um, you know, clothes hanging, Japanese style slippers and benches. Um, the image on the bottom right where it is a place you can get water, so even participatory, but actually the water has, has um, pebbles and, and sand in it, so you can't really drink it. So there's all these things that you challenge, the, he challenged his um, viewers. Um, you know, a lot of people walked in. At, there's an actual, um, like a diary from an artist at the time 
documenting what everybody said, you know, well, what is this exhibition? Like, there's no exhibition. Well, am I supposed to walk underneath the clothing line? Oh, that's bad luck. So, like, people are talking <laughs> amongst themselves of what, what to make of this absurdist um, uh, Echo de Great Taipei exhibition. Actually, in the, uh, the Chinese name for this Echo de Great Taipei is actually the Great Taipei Painting Society. So it's almost, it's totally a false advertisement. So people came like, what am I looking at and looking for? Um, stuff, rubbish on the left side and all these, you know, paintings that are not really shown. But what's really interesting is that the sound in this space actually had Beatles. Um, so it's, it's you know, multi-sensory, very preliminary kind of installation that happened during that time. But you, and here I also wanted to show this kind of, um, Western music and Western influence as a way of escaping their real reality. Um, that, you know, it's a, it's a channel for them. It's a, it's a, it's a step, stepping stone for imagining what the other world would look like. Um, so I, sh I showed you Zhang Zhaopan's um, experimental film before, but he's actually more most known as a avant-garde photographer. Um, the images on the uh, and on this page are all um, uh, natural photos. Nothing was manipulated in the darkroom. Um, the top left is probably the most iconic image of that time, where uh, it's a self-portrait of the artist standing on the um, on the terrace of his family house, um, using the natural sunlight against a uh, white wall. And the way that he positioned himself was to, to cut his own head off. So this kind of um, stark, um, this lone man, um, headless, looking afar at the landscape, is a way for him to express that kind of um, dissatisfaction, anger at the environment that's really enclosing him. Um, so you see how um, earlier on in the film, he, uh, and, and his film stills, um, people with masks, the characters with masks here without even the head, um, you know, this kind of uh, very symbolic ways of showing the, um, the, the generational aesthetics at the time. And here you, know, you also see these staged um, photographs playing with angles of almost like a murder scene on the top right, uh, where you see this, these limbs kind of just laid flat there. Um, or children out of focus, and like people with masks in these desolate areas, another headless man on the left. So the, the backdrop of all these photos are um, in this area called Banqiao, which is on the outskirts of Taipei. At the time, it was just about to develop into um, a, a bigger metropolis being industrialized. So um, Zhang Zhangkang is from this region, he's witnessing that kind of rapid change in his own area, so you know, places, uh, uh, places being taken down, but some remnants are re re remain. So he's really catching that kind of um, lost uh, feeling of people struggling between the old and the new during this time. As I said, he's a document, uh, docu uh, is a documentation, uh, documentarian, so here are a few shots on the top are from the 60s, on the bottom from 70s to the 80s of Taiwanese society. So you see traces of that older generation of documenting what Taiwanese life was like. Um, uh, workers, um, but you can see it still as traces of landscape. Whereas on the bottom, is, you see the temple uh, theater performance, um, a Mickey Mouse in the, uh, in, the, in the crowd, in the temple, the prayers. Um, the, on the beach are actually, we call them the frogmen, who are the, um, um, the Taiwanese marines. They're, they're, they're actually supposed to be able to swim from Taiwan all the way to Fujian province, which is only about 200 kilometers. Uh, they're the amphibian, what do you call it, like marines, and amphibian um, troops. So, um, yes, <laughs> the Taiwan's finest. And then on the right is um, in the 80s. I mean, people are the, the society is more pro prosperous then. Um, this is uh, the famous uh, Ali Shan uh, sunset in the middle of Taiwan. So middle class people all showed up at 5 a.m. to look at the amazing sunset. So even though when Zhang Zhaopan was taking these more um, everyday document um, documentation of Taiwanese life, there's still a sense of absurdness, um, a bit of a displaced aesthetic. 
Yes. So coming to um, the final bit um, of Chen Yao Qi, um, the, 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 he was and he, he he's an artist who was part of that theater group, um, but not as a uh, not as a writer too much, more as a filmmaker. So here is where UCLA comes in. He's um, he graduated <laughs> from the UCLA <laughs> film department, um, a very rare opportunity for people from Taiwan. Um, he had a little bit of background. Um, his grandpa uh, was a um, Catholic priest. Catholic? Catholic priest, priest for uh, many of the um, high officials of the nationalist government. So I think his opportunities are a bit better than others. Um, but he's no uh, mainstream filmmaker. Um, he went to UCLA and was very inspired by the cinema verite um, method that was taught there. So um, this film, Liu uh, Jia, is his uh, graduation thesis, um, which is also the same clip I showed earlier on. Um, it's about this um, uh, war veteran, uh, World War II, a Civil War veteran, who's a nobody that he chose. Um, and after these veterans came to Taiwan, the government had to find something for them to do, because the, there was no war, really. Um, so the workforce, they became the workforce for a lot of infrastructure pro projects. So this particular project happened on the eastern side of Taiwan to build a dam. Um, and so in a, in, at a time, nobody is using this kind of marginal character, marginal person in this society as a main um, star of a documentary, so that A is very radical. B, he, uh, the filmmaker showed the really the actual hardship of what that means by, you know, you're, you're actually a pawn of your, of your, of your government. You join a, you join a military when you barely know what's going on, and then now you're in a place where you're separated from most of your family because of the situation, and you're put into a labor force. So, um, the film was quite radical at the time, um, but it really inspired uh, generations of um, I think I'm farmers. And because this was a UCLA thesis film, there was English, <laughs> which is rare at the time. And just the opening shot of this film, you see landscapes. You know, it's both both in a Chinese sort of landscape painting way, but also a realist way of seeing this barren land of building a dam. So he's establishing this kind of um, environment for the uh, collective work. It was very traditional uh, flute um, music from the traditional uh, tr from Chinese Chinese orchestras. Okay, and then we show. Um, oops. My mouse disappeared. Chairman Zeng of the Eastern Taiwan Land Development Commission. Came to Feng Tian on the inspection uh, tour on the day of May Festival. The festival commemorates a 3rd century BC patriotic poet, Qu Yuan, who drowned himself as a silent protest against the unjust king. At an open air banquet, Chairman Dong spoke to the 1700 men, praising their accomplishment. Three people, um, you see them on the right, um, 
And the filmmaker actually himself is on the left um, in that photo. Um, so he had friends helping him film it, but the whole idea was his. Um, so he was interviewing these three um, young art students who are still in college um, and asked them so what are their aspirations in life, what they feel about things, and actually all three of them wanted to commit themselves to filmmaking. Um, and the mountain is where all these, these three kids go um, on the weekend, on leisurely, um, where they would visit this um, Zen Buddhist um, monk. Um, so, in a way, so this kind of going up in the mountain thing is another way, literally, to escape from what's really trapping them city. And so um, I show four clips from this um, if the mouse works. Oops. For those that is the name of Taiwan, um, that the Portuguese sailors in the 16th century had called it, which is a Virgin city. Um, so that's why we started. So you hear mamas and papas California dreaming um, throughout the film, so people eating in the, um, the stalls. But there's actually four different versions of this music throughout this film. And you can try to think about why that juxtaposition, juxtaposition is meaningful for this this. So she's talking about whether she has a chance to go to Raw to study. And she was denied of that chance because she's not a party member. But then somebody else who's a party member was also stripped of her uh, opportunity because she has a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's actually quite courageous to show that during that time. It's, here's a reason to the Vietnam War. Hmm. Mm, Taiwan at the time was the resting spot for all American allies. So that is front and center in their lives, and you know that's always in the news. But these, these group of artists are, in a way, apathetic towards politics, even though their lives are completely embodied. But there's some release in their mountain trips. This is at the end of the film. So in the mountains, they can do anything they wanted. Uh, no one is going to say anything about their behavior and conduct, um, losing themselves in nature, kind of doing nothing. Um, so that was, um, at the time, it was actually quite, it was very, um, I guess, stimulating for a lot of other people who have never studied abroad and don't know this is a way of filmmaking, but really seeing their own selves reflected reflected in uh, and their emotions reflected in these very simple films. So even though um, censorship was tight, um, there's some traces of life during that period. Um, I just wanted to bring up one interesting fact. Um, the theater magazine was actually uh, stopped in 1968, not because censorship, it's only because the artists themselves all went separate ways. 
But um, in 1965, they actually got a subscription from the uh, PNP party supporting <laughs> the continuation of this. So, you know, sometimes it's, it was very difficult to judge what was allowed and what wasn't. And perhaps one of the um, members of this magazine, um, whose father was a deputy director of the National Palace Museum, uh, helped in certain ways, but maybe it didn't. But you never know where the party lies sometimes. Um, and I just wanted to end with uh, this kind of a, 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 what do you call it, a coda of uh, I Come the Great Taipei, 10th anniversary by Wang Machen. So this is an advertisement that he had put out on the art magazine called Lion Art um, in June 1976, um, trying to solicit money from people to buy this stamp-like poster of um, uh, their intimate sort of choreography with the American flag you see there. Um, so he's again making this absurdist um, uh, sort of position of um, you know this is a this is a poster for that they called the Great Taipei and wanting people to buy them to support the um, activities of the of the of the group which is himself. Um, so actually it was never produced really, and nobody really subscribed to it. But this is, I don't think it mattered to him either way. It's actually just a statement. So I end there. Um, that's a very quick snapshot of the visual field of uh, post war Taiwan uh, from ink paintings, to, well, from Japanese style paintings to ink paintings to more uh, realist photography to this group of. Artists starting in the 1960s to work with um, image making and really inserting the Taiwanese consciousness um, uh, that's unique. And following this decade, um, because Taiwan was no longer uh, in the UN and had no more US diplomatic relations, um, the same group of artists focus even more on the Taiwanese identity uh, from filmmaking to literature to art making. And really, the American influence was there, but um, the sort of Taiwanese imagery and ideas are even more common than that. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And thank you very much. The research and also the whole articulation and vocabulary around that you've built up and in academic work, but maybe my question also to share with, uh, with the audience is that because you work also as a curator and, mm -hmm. and some of the people in the room will not take your seven, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about how all of this research has developed uh, in projects that you've done mm -hmm. and, or projects of peers uh, that you've seen in recent years and how all this material culture, some of them, like remastered films, etc., okay, have emerged and how you've worked with this archival in yeah. Sure. Um, so all this research um, was um, presented in a, an exhibition um, in Parasite in Hong Kong um, a few years ago. Um, of course, this was all built on many other art historians and artists' work. Um, so I put together an exhibition with uh, two colleagues, Cosmo Costinas and Dorian Chong, um, on the um, uh, performative works that was happening in uh, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan during the 1960s. Um, so in each of these locations, um, there's always the mainstream art present, but there's also groups of people who are unsatisfied with that kind of more traditional wall-mounted uh, productions, and they either took it to the streets, using their bodies, using other way of, ways of image making to insert their own um, uh, subjectivity. So the show was um, framed with this great crescent, um, Frame with this great crescent as the premise, um, highlighting the connections, um, highlighting the connections between. Can you turn on the light just for one second? The, the big... Highlighting the connections between these seemingly separate art circles, but they're all tied together by this fate of being on the Pacific Rim, a geographic, geopolitical um, 
connection that was there in the front lines against communism. Um, and that's where American um, military and, and um, culture has infiltrated. So, you know, as these three places also had an interesting history with, with each other, um, the colonization of one of two, the other two. Um, so it was especially interesting to put these three locations, um, artists' performances, in, in, in a kind of comparative art history way. Um, none of them knew of each other. Like the Japanese artists didn't really know what Korean artists were doing. Taiwanese artists didn't know elsewhere. So, but there were some um, affinities and connections of their actions, um, whether it's on theater stage through the uh, magazines or um, in, on the streets. May have good <laughs> Thank you. The I guess this is more an anecdotal question. I wonder, like, how did you encounter the theater magazine? Is was it just to understand? Was it something that was a bit obscured, or was it part of the? It was sort of lost um, in our history for a while, but I was lucky that um, right before we decided to talk about this exhibition, there was an issue um, of an art magazine um, from the Tainan Academy of uh, Tainan University of the Arts. They did a whole issue examining this theater magazine. So three or four researchers were all working on that. Um, um, doing very deep analysis on that avant-garde that seemed to be lost. So I was the beneficiary of their research. Um, but that was, um, they're all text-based, not an exhibition form. So um, I was able to um, learn from their research and then make this just juxtaposition with my two other curatorial colleagues on how they would um, be in dialogue um, later in history with the Japanese and the South Korean um, counterparts. So, and since then, this um, theater magazine has spawned many, many more exhibitions. Um, I don't want to say it's all because of our exhibition, but <laughs> um, I think people have paid more attention to it. Um, also, uh, some younger artists of, um, in their 30s re-performed many of the works that were um, uh, chronicled in the magazine or, or made an alternative history of it. So, in the past four or five years, that has been. If you talk about theater magazine in the Taiwanese art world, people know what it is. The, in this reenactment, there was actually the couple that you showed. Uh, there was a recent reenactment yes. with the real actors, right? Yes. yes. So, so um, the, the artists that were involved originally um, were invited back to reperform the piece of their use um, that was absurdist then and absurdist now. <laughs> <laughs> This is a bit uh, of a, kind of coming from another discussion, but all of this material, the 60s and 70s, globally has emerged uh, first in research and institutionally, but it has been rapidly uh, editioned and produced and uh, commercialized in the uh, commercial world of the art world, you know? and which the context of, uh, I guess, the stage of capitalism that existed back then isn't the same as ours, and today we have this manifestation of like heavily commercializing uh, this type of artwork. You no, know? uh, in the past, I guess, maybe <coughs> fifteen years, there has been significant presence in art fairs, etc., and photographs documenting performances or redigitized photographs, created editions of. All of this and uh, more, um, obscure. yeah, obscure or uh, dematerialized art. No, um, I wanted to know more, maybe your your take on this, and specifically on how this filmmakers and the Taiwanese generation is dealing with this, and uh, to understand a little bit your opinion and maybe the landscape of it. I would say that the artists that I talked about, um, their works are re, being re-studied re or rediscovered by the current generation, um, um, but in a more limited way. I think the films that I showed um, were recently remastered, um, and they were in the Taiwan Film Archive, and they were shown in the 
uh, independent film festival in Taipei two years ago, but independent film festival is not the golden horse, <laughs> you know, the golden horse is not so mainstream these days, but, um, but you know, it's not, you know, it's not everyone's knowledge, but I think they have gotten that kind of, um, I don't think they, at the time when they were making art in the 60s, they weren't caring about being official or not, because that wasn't the goal. Um, the official ones are the painters um, who are easily exhibited, um, exported out, outside of Taiwan. So, but I don't think they harness any kind of, you know, anxiety because of that status, because they all had their own um, artistry. Um, I'm pretty close to John Dalton. I've worked with him on a couple curatorial projects before, and I think, I mean, the first time I met him, I, I thought, well, this is such a rebel artist, I don't know, you know, I do ink paintings, so is he going to talk to me? Um, <laughs> you know, but I mean, he's very open-minded, and, um, you know, there was a lot of personality, but I mean, I don't think he really cared about all these sort of art world phenomena. Um, he didn't even have his photographs edition before that. He didn't really have the sort of market. To do. But I think what really was good recently is that they, um, as much as these artists didn't care about being part of history, they were, and it was a very um, important moment in that post-war history. So it's it's great that they are being um, re-evaluated in what with, within academia, within the museum culture, um, uh, and so on. So yeah. I'm talking to anybody who wants to have a question. Yes. Um, uh, can you talk about more about abstraction um, since you mentioned earlier that uh, there was an abstraction movement also contemporaneous with the Avangar that you nominated. So what was what was their relationship? Uh, was there was there this junction or tension? And was it was this articulated uh, in like these journals? Um, that's a very good question. Um, so this group of artists who work in abstraction, um, they, um, they're studio artists, so they don't actually do things outdoors or outside, um, but there are tangential relations. So the painting on the far left um, by Zhuang Zhe, he is the brother, older, one of the older brothers of Zhuang Ling, who's the one that filmed his wife and kids. Um, so, Talk about that family is a whole different story because the father is the you know the chaperone, the scholar of Chinese painting and calligraphy, and then the sons are all art historians, archaeologists, paint, abstract painter, and, and, and uh, I digress. Um, so there's that familial um, relations. Uh, the artist who made that I called the Great Taipei, he actually graduated from the same school of all of these people. Um, so there is, so, you know, they attended each other's exhibitions, but of course they didn't really make the same kind of art. Um, there wasn't really animosity or anything. They really recognized that we're doing different things. I'm modern, you're also modern, but our modernism is a little bit different. Um, so, yeah, that's, I don't think they hate each other. But, <laughs> but I think within the theater, the one of the reasons why it, it dissolved really was that there's one part of um, the group that wants things to be more realist, mm -hmm. um, you know, re realist, not in an abstract sense, that obviously, but more realist and using realist ways to talk about um, the, their real feelings, whereas there's another side of them, another part of this group wanted to be, do things more absurdist, more surrealist, and more um, you know, insinuation rather than real, so that's the split. Um, that's more or less it. Hi, Leslie. I have a question about the show, um, which I realized was in the tiny space of Paris. <laughs> and uh, the crown three countries <laughs> in, uh, in that space is a uh, major cosmic move. <laughs> um, yes. 
<laughs> so I wanted to ask about uh, the, the three, <clears throat> so you have Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. And uh, without falling into the trap of generalizing, um, I want, my question has to do with what were the biggest similarities between the three? Because you said that they all developed and they were all independent. That's right. And they didn't know what each, each other was doing. So I want to, my question has to do with what were the similarities and why do you think they had those similarities? And if there were differences, what were the differences? It's another lecture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make it short. Um, I think the fun part of curating this project with two other colleagues is that we all came from different understandings. So I obviously know the Taiwanese um, groups the best. Dorian is J Japan and Korea very well. Um, so we we started to talk about what, what are the performative um, tendencies of these societies. That's what where we began. Um, uh, and each of them are a little different. I think the Japanese artists, I don't know if I can show. Um, the Japanese artists had more performative, oops. Yeah, they did the ship. Oh, right here, on the left. Um, uh, they had these more, um, uh, I guess, more radical um, body performances on the streets or nudity and sort of protesting the American infiltration of society, um, also the mil mil militarization of Japan under American rule. Um, and so that kind of, and also because Japan's art has always been the most westernized in all of these societies, so the kind of um, connection there is a bit different from how uh, Korea and Taiwan dealt with it. Korean artists was dealing with also a dictator regime. Um, they're also dealing with the post-Korean War situation, post-colonial. So um, they also had many performative actions. Um, artists who are working against the academic um, tree. Taiwanese artists, less of these actions, but as you can see, their actions take, took place in the magazines, or theater, or film. No. So less of these street performances um, or um, happenings, if you will, but more textual, um, a lot of more absorption, and um, playing with graphic design, or um, or collaborative. Um, I, mean, I guess the, the differences are there, but the, the very one similarity between all these three societies is the collaborative efforts. Um, you know, it's a lot of times you know the group name, you don't know the individual names. Mm -hmm. And they do these group actions together. The, the photos, documentations that you see are all groups of people. Um, so it's it's a very collaborative spirit during these pretty hard times. I think that's actually what I also said during the a collaborative era, just like the curators, the three of us were collaborating mm -hmm. um, putting this together. So mm -hmm. that's the short version of what I have to <laughs> The show had uh, two other tour, touring venues to the Mori Art Museum and then to the uh, University Art Museum in Mexico City. So they took on other versions um, and different uh, parts. But the parasite, I mean, the parasite space is small, it's probably like that size. Um, but because we didn't have any actions, it was all documentations and, and you know, film, so it was easily contained and it didn't seem to be overwhelming. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Did I see that? Oh, um, sorry, no, I was going to this one. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody else in the room? I am working on ink. <laughs> uh, so the museum will open next year. Um, we're working on the opening exhibitions, which is uh, going to be all collection based. Um, so each of us curators work together on putting putting together the um, what M Plus is about. So hopefully next year when we open, um, you get to see the um, history of design architecture, history of visual art. Um, from the mid 20th century to today of Asia and beyond. So um, my job is to um, 
look at the development of ink, the ink art development for the past 60 years and see how we can integrate that together with a larger visual art history. Um, so some of the artists I talked about uh, abstraction, those are artists that uh, actually I showed all the works in M plus collection, <laughs> which I acquired. <laughs> but I mean, that's also um, an important part of modernist um, abstraction that hasn't been written into the larger history um, of, 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 of the world. Um, so we're working on that. Um, so that's why I said it's actually great for me to skip out of that for a second and uh, look at the um, other passion that I have. mentioned a banana so that had you been uh, researching him or well, you did your homework before that. <laughs> <laughs> so one of my first trips to Manila, Manila I went to the Ayala Museum and saw an exhibition of uh, of Zobel's work. And actually in the auction world they call Zobel the um Zao Ki of of Southeast Asia. So oh, wow. because you know it's similar, I mean if you look up their work online, it's, it's, there's the similarities um, of that European lyr lyrical abstraction tradition. Um, they're both um, from this re from the region of Asia and then had training about, uh, uh, abroad and so on. So, um, yeah, and if I had more time, I would probably um, do more research. <laughs> oh, if there's nobody else. Yes, thank you very much, Leslie. Thank you.